The fifth annual Clinton Global Initiative this weekend at George Washington University. Daniel D. Vizet of the Washington Post writing about it this week. What's behind the initiative? How did it start and what's its purpose? Well, Bill Clinton came up with the idea five years ago. It's connected to his Clinton Global Initiative, which brings world leaders together to talk about the big problems of the day. This is simply taking the same concept and applying it uh, to colleges and college students. The first group gathered in New Orleans uh, after Hurricane Katrina, and they looked at a whole bunch of different service projects that students had come up with from all over the world. And the idea is uh, former President Clinton wanted to take these projects and help the students figure out how to make them sort of scalable and to, to make some of them into reality. It's, it's sort of being more ambitious with the idea of community service, which has caught on at college campuses all over the country in the last 10 or 20 years. Aside from obviously being the, uh, the former president, what's his role with the, the initiative? Is it, is it fundraising? Is it reaching out to uh, the students who attend this, for this weekend's event, for example? I think he sees his role as bringing all these people together and sort of creating the, uh, the, the venue for it. The idea is more that these people meet each other because you've got group, a, a woman from New York University who's stitching dolls for kids who have night terrors. You've got a team from uh, one Washington University that's made bamboo bicycles. Uh, you've got a, another team uh, that, is, that is working toward... Uh, uh, health care needs in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And the idea is to get all these people together in one room and to get them to learn from each other and to learn from some experts. And Bill Clinton brings his name and his credentials uh, to, the, to, the, to the event and sort of brings them all together. And it's a fairly um, A-list lineup of people this weekend for the um, Initiative University in Washington. Well, uh, let's see. John Stewart is going to be there, and he and Former President Clinton will do a conversation uh, Saturday uh, afternoon. That's kind of a big draw. I know Chelsea Clinton will be there, um, Madeleine Albright, uh, Usher, and a bunch of other people, including some people who founded big either nonprofit or for-profit things that started out essentially as college endeavors. And do, do a number of these groups leave uh, from the initiative with some commitment of funding from the group? Let me think. I, I do know that each participant has to have a commitment, and it has to be a specific thing that addresses a known problem in some sort of novel way. I, I don't know that anybody uh, is guaranteed any sort of funding or, or future for their project. I think the whole idea is to get these people together and to get them to learn how to make the thing actionable, basically. These are mostly students, and they have these great ideas. A lot of them, though, they only know how to be students. They don't know how to be uh, nonprofit directors or how to, how to launch a company. And this, the idea is that they come here and learn to do these things. Daniel DeVise with The Washington Post. You can read his reporting at WashingtonPost.com. Thank you for the update. Thank you. The Clinton Global Initiative University was founded in 2007 by former President Bill Clinton to engage students in developing solutions to global challenges. This year's meeting focuses on education, poverty, the environment and climate change, peace and human rights, and public health. Now the former president moderates a discussion of leaders engaged in these issues and how to foster a broader culture of civic engagement. Among the speakers is President Clinton's former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. This year's meeting is being held at George Washington University. Now I would like to introduce our panelists. And as all of you know, I'm going to ask them a question or two, and they're basically going to tell their stories in a way that makes it relevant to you and your lives and why you came here. After which, we're going to take your questions. So supply us some. <laughs> First, President Knapp, who's already been introduced. I'd like for him to come out and take a chair. S second. The first woman ever to be Secretary of State of the United States, appointed by some long ago President, Madeleine Albright. Who, third, I'd like to call out the founder of Carolina for Kibera, Rye Barcott.
He wrote an amazing book that some of you are familiar with that happened on the way to war. He co-founded Carolina for Cabrera, a non-governmental organization to prevent ethnic and gender violence in Nairobi while serving in the United States Marine Corps. He's a graduate of the Un Un University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the Kennedy School and the Business School at Harvard, where he was a rental social entrepreneurship fellow. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife and daughter, and among other things, works in Duke Energy's sustainability department as a special advisor to the chairman. I'd like to invite out Sadiqa Basiri Saleem, the executive director of the Aruj Learning Center in Afghanistan. Our last panelist is a good friend of mine, <laughs> known to the larger world, I'm his token old friend, <laughs> not old friend, old friend, <laughs> known to the world as Usher. <laughs> Usher Raymond IV has been an award-winning artist for more than 15 years known for his fluid voice and his dynamic dance moves. <laughs> his acting in film, television, and stage, including a Broadway stint as Billy Flynn in the Tony Award winning musical Chicago. He's won multiple Grammys for his work, but in addition to all that, he has been a staunch advocate for youth empowerment and education and has proven to be a powerful force by mentoring young people around the world through his New Look Foundation. In July 2011, Usher held the second annual World Leadership Conference and Awards in Atlanta, where 500 young people from around the world convened to develop real-world solutions to global problems. He is a very good man who is doing something that someone in his position does not have to do. And I've been down there at his event, and I can tell you, it's not for show, it's the real deal. Please welcome Usher. I would like to, uh, I want to begin with Rye. So you're in the Marine Corps, and you should tell everybody where Cabrera is. What skills did you get in the Marine Corps that got you involved in that kind of work? And how did you decide when you left the stand of the service to do this? How many, how many of y'all have heard of Kibera before? All right, all right. A few hands up. It's located in the uh, on the outskirts of Nairobi, Kenya, and it's one of the larger informal settlements. Residents there call it a slum, and it is a, a slum community. About half a million folks live there in an area about the size of Central Park. And I was a, a junior at UNC Chapel Hill. And I knew that I was going in the Marine Corps because that was really my first calling in life. Uh, my father had served in the Marines, and like all of us here in this room, you know, I wanted to make a difference. And the Marine Corps appeared to be a way to do that. Um, and so I chased that dream, and it had, a look, it had a clarifying effect because, you know, when you're at college, you often hear that use this opportunity to discover what you want to do. And and I think it is a, it's an amazing moment in life to discover what you want to do. But it really helps if you have a little bit of an idea going into it. And, and so I was able to kind of craft my, my studies based on uh, my, my service going into the Marines. This was in, in uh, 2000, so it was before September 11th. And most of the missions that the Marines were engaged on were peacekeeping missions. 
And so I want to have a better understanding of why ethnic violence happened in the world. And uh, a mentor of mine who was an anthropologist at school told me that, you know, there's only so much that you can learn from books. And if you really want to understand why something happens in the world, you've got to go someplace and actually put yourself into it. And so I'd taken some Swahili classes with our, uh, our, our starting lineup for the men's basketball team. We were, uh, we were all in class together. And, and, uh, and that was important for me because you had to learn some of the local language before going to a place that's very different from your own. And the Marine Corps really gave me, because I was going through training at that time, they really gave me the courage in some ways to, uh, to go to a place that was very different from my own and, and confront some of my fears in doing so. And so I, I rented a small 10 by 10 foot shack in Kibera uh, with, a, with a young person who was about my age. And I, I just asked questions and I just listened. Um, listening, President Clinton asked what some of the skills were from the military that transla translated to the NGO world. Um, listening was not one of them. Uh, <laughs> listening is actually a skill that translated from NGO work that, to the military and what we can do better on in the military. Um, but I wasn't intending to start an organization. And what I realized in these, in these really difficult conditions was a fundamental truth in the world. And that is that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. Talent's universal, but opportunity is not. Yeah, it's really a truth. And, and so the question is, how do you best connect that talent with opportunity? And, um, and I didn't know what the answer was, but I continued to form some relationships. And over many years, we built an organization called Carolina for Kibera. One of our co-founders was a neighbor of mine named Tabitha Festo. And she was a former nurse. She, she had, uh, was widowed with three kids. And towards the end of my first summer, she confronted me. And she asked me for uh, 2,000 shillings, which was about the equivalent of $26. Uh, and I had made a habit of not giving out any money in Kibera, in part because I didn't know where to begin, in part because I just, I, I, for my own safety. Um, and so I asked her what she was planning to do with it, and she said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell veggies, vegetables. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell veggies here in Kibera. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell them across, I'm going to buy them here in Kibera. I'm going to sell them across town in a Somali community where I can undercut the competition. And so she looked at me and she said, you know, believe in me. And she had a plan, and I was leaving the next day, and it was only 26 bucks. And so I handed her the 2,000 shillings. I came back to the United States. I went to boot, uh, boot camp for officers, officer candidate school in the Marines. And, 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 and then I went into my senior year. And as I was going into my senior year, this line from the Marines kept sticking in my head. And the line was, have a bias for action. A bias for action. And what I was doing back at school was I was writing this research report, this thesis. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't giving back anything to this particular community where I'd fell, fallen into some relationships that mattered. Long story short, we just, I decided to start an organization. We called it Carolina for Kibera. It was in my dorm room, my 10 by 10, uh, in my senior year, about midway through it. And initially, the goal was really use sports, particularly soccer, as a way to bring different ethnic groups together. And we raised a little bit of money and we returned to Kibera. The Marine Corps gave me three months of unpaid leave to do this. In part because I think most of the military commanders that I served with had an appreciation that preventing violence, the cost to prevent violence, are always so far lower than the cost to intervene during it. And we see that today for sure. I returned back to Kibera. I, I had no idea whether or not I'd see Tabitha again. I barely reckon, rem remembered her from the previous year, but she found me. And she found me and took me zigzagging through these alleyways to her own 10 by 10. And what she had done is she had taken her savings from selling vegetables for six months of about $100 and pursued her dream. She started a small medical clinic out of her, out of her shack. And she was a nurse and she was offering quality care. And it made a lot of sense for us, for, this, for, this, for, for her to become a part of our organization, Carolina for Kibera. And as we grew it together over many years, taking what we call a participatory approach, um, she grew that clinic. And today that clinic treats over 40,000 patients a year. 40,000 patients a year. And, and I'm going to wrap up, but I, I just, it, it started with $26. You know, but $26 in the hands of a remarkable person, working in partnership together, taking a long view, taking a participatory approach over, over 10 years. 
And when I step back and I think about being in your shoes, I remember, I remember just feeling so overwhelmed by the number of options that, you have, that I have, that, that you all have in school. And I still think, you know, real change, real social change in particular, it takes that depth of commitment to a particular place. And that's what I hope that um, you'll be able to find with the causes and the places that you care about. Thank you. So, 